Lisa, welcome. Thank you. Please introduce yourself and tell us where we are. Okay, my name is Lisa Ann Smith and I'm the author of Hastings Mill, The Historic Times of a Vancouver Community. And um, this afternoon, we're privileged to be right here in the old Hastings Mill Store Museum, which is uh, one of the only surviving buildings of the original Hastings Mill town site. The oldest building in Vancouver. Correct, the oldest building in Vancouver, dating from 1868. Could you set the scene for us in, in 1868 when they, just before they started to build this mill, what, what was here? What, what was around the mill site? Okay, well it was all wilderness at one point. I should mention that the building where it stands now was not the original location. It was uh, originally just east of Gastown at the foot of Dunleavy Street, what's now Dunleavy Street, and then it was brought over here in 1930. So that's uh, another story which I, I guess we'll get to. But um, the original site was just pristine forest. There was a small indigenous community, Squamish community, called Gum Gum Lai, which was uh, just east of what became the mill town site. And uh, there were other indigenous communities in the area. There was uh, communities in Stanley Park, what we now know today as Stanley Park and also over on the North Shore. But um, back in 1868, things were pretty quiet. It was surrounded by this pristine wilderness yeah. and, and forest resources that you could hardly imagine, really. Um, and this is near the tail end of the gold rush. And yeah. I guess New Westminster would have been the, the closest community? Yeah, yeah. New Westminster definitely existed by that time. And um, it wasn't accessible by road just yet from Vancouver, what became Vancouver. You had to, to uh, get to Port Moody and then take a, a boat down Burrard Inlet. Or you had to come the long way around the Fraser River to the mouth of the river and, and back around and enter Burrard Inlet from the, the west side. But it, it was pretty inaccessible for its time. And who's the man that had the dream to, to build the first mill? The, the man that decided to build this store was Captain Edward Stamp. So he came out uh, here from England in the mid-1800s, originally uh, did a little bit of work in the Seattle region, Puget Sound. He um, established a sawmill for a time period in um, Alberni, the head of Alberni Inlet, and uh, that was a financial loss. <laughs> So he and he, lots of pushback from the local indigenous lots people, of pushback right? They, they didn't from the want local, him there. Yes, lots of pushback from the local indigenous community, the Shishot, and also the terrain just wasn't working for him. He didn't have the equipment that he needed to harvest the trees from that area. So he was looking for a new site, and he uh, came across the strait, came into Broad Inlet, and uh, liked what he saw here. The land was a lot flatter, more accessible, and of course the main thing was there were plenty of, of uh, old growth trees. Douglas fir and cedar and all the trees that were the most marketable. Some of them in this building, right? Yes. The original firs are still yes. here. Yes, this Douglas fir center beam, this would have come from a tree that was about um, three times that height, and that is the, most of the, the superstructure that you see up there is original. From 1868. So he builds the the sawmill on site and at the same time he's housing his employees, right? They, yeah. they live on site and this is the genesis of a Vancouver, is it not? That's right. Yeah. Well there was another community further down inlet originally called New Brighton mm -hmm. which eventually became known as Hastings. And that was more or less a resort community for the people of New Westminster to come to so they could access that uh, via the North Road, which had been put through by the Royal Engineers some time ago. And the people of New Westminster, they liked to come out to, to this part of the inlet because it was uh, escape from the mosquitoes and <laughs> the, the sea breezes were fresher. Yeah. So, so that's where, that was really the, the very first colonial community on Burrard Inlet and then um, there was a small sawmill on the North Shore, which eventually became known as Moodyville, mm -hmm. and that, was, that just predated uh, 
stamps mill by uh, a year or two and then Stampus began actual work on the sawmill in 1865. But at what point did he realize uh, we need a store, we, we need to supply the, yeah. the workers here? Yeah, well there was a store across the water in the, the small sawmill that became known as Moodyville. Mm -hmm. And um, there was actually a small store on the, the Hastings Mill site, the Stamps Mill site, I should say. And um, it was just set up in a warehouse and it basically amounted to one sales counter and everything was uh, higgledy-piggledy, all the, the um, items that they sold, the, the workers that came in there, they had to scrounge among all the supplies to find what they were looking for. And Stamp realized what, what he really needed was a proper store. So he, we don't have any exact date of, of when work began on this store, but uh, we do know that in late 1868, room was freed up in this warehouse to set up a reading room, uh, uh, 1868 version of a library, if you will. So that meant that, that the store that was in the warehouse had been transferred over to, to this new location, this store that Stamp had built right on the waterfront on pilings. And he had experience in Victoria, didn't he? He had, a, yeah. he had stores there, so he, yeah. he knew that side of the business. Yeah. And, and how important did the role of the store come to be in, in the community? Oh, most important. Mm -hmm. it, it was essential. It wasn't only just a store. It was a community gathering place. It was really um, the first community center in Vancouver, if you will, in the uh, colonial setting. So people would come here for um, social interaction, you know, this would have been particularly important in the winter time when it was cold and dark and rainy and isolated. There was an oil drum fire in the middle of the, the building, so everyone would gather around there and they would play cards and, and um, the post office opened in the entry vestibule in 1874. That was the first post office in uh, the community that became known as, as Granville or informally Gastown in the era. So, you know, a lot of um, things happened over time to, to create a real social atmosphere at the, uh, the store. And the store, as I understand it, was situated facing the water. Yes. The, the people came off the boats or off, off the docks yeah. and, and into the store. That's yeah. fascinating. Because there, there, that was the only way to access the store. There was no approach from the land at this time. There might have been a few um, trails, but you know there wasn't any access for any kind of a, a vehicle and horses. So the, the, the best approach was from the water. So that's why the store was built on pilings facing, facing uh, Broad Inlet. In your book, Hastings Mill, you capture so much of Vancouver's story. They, they parallel each other, don't they? They do. And, and uh, we move a little bit further ahead in time to the Great Fire yeah. uh, that happened in, in Gastown. And, and Hastings Mill plays a really significant role in that. Could you tell us about that? Well, uh, Hastings Mill was extremely fortunate because it was just barely out of the trajectory of the fire. The fire blew in a, a northeasterly direction from where it started down by Falls Creek. And um, as luck would have it, it just barely bypassed the, the Hastings Mill town site. There was a couple of buildings right on the edge, a couple of people's homes that were destroyed. They were consumed um, and the, the manager's fence. But other than that, the entire town site survived. So it, it became a, a gathering place. So all those folks who lost their places to live in Gastown, they yeah. came to Hastings Mill. They came they? to Hastings Mill. They actually ran to Hastings <laughs> Mill anyways or during the, the water, fire. I yeah, guess. they were escaping the fire and um, families were separated during the fire. Uh, Hastings Mill store would have been known as a, a local landmark at that time. So parents might have yelled to their children, run for the store, we'll meet you there. So there, the store became a, a triage center and a place for families to reunite. 
after the fire. So it must have been a, a really amazing and dramatic scene at that time. In the the book, you you share a, a telegram that goes off uh, on horseback, I think, from Hastings Mill to New Westminster, and it's the mayor pleading for help from, from the Prime Minister? Yeah, yeah, that was the, the famous telegram that read, our city is ashes, 3,000 people homeless, can you send any government aid? So Mayor Malcolm McLean, he was the Vancouver's first mayor actually, and he'd taken refuge on the Robert Kerr offshore. This was a, a ship that had been sitting derelict in the harbour for some time. So he got back to Hastings Mill and saw that, you know, there were all these people converging that had lost their homes and realized that, that the only way to kickstart uh, recovery would be to get financial aid from the federal government. So he sent off his city clerk, Thomas McGuigan, on a fast horse to New Westminster saying, can we get some government aid? Yeah. And We're part terrible. of the country now. Could we get some help, please? <laughs> that would they, be so they, easy, they, wouldn't it? <laughs> they, they had just joined, hadn't Quick they? Quick email. <laughs> yes. And, and part of the story also you, you go into is just uh, this amazing rebuilding of Vancouver virtually yeah. overnight. Yeah. And uh, does Hastings Mill play a part in that? I, I think the manager of the mill, for instance, was offering up lumber, was yes, he not? For that? that was Richard Alexander. He was the manager of Hastings Mill at the time. And uh, he just told people who had lost their homes, come and help yourself to as much free lumber as you want. So it was very generous of him. His wife, uh, Emma Alexander, she was wonderful. She uh, Vancouver became a city of tents after the fire. There were a lot of government issue tents that were sent over from Victoria. So she would literally walk from one tent to the next, basket in hand, asking people inside if there was anything they needed. And she was, um, get, she organized a relief committee with other women who had lost their homes and um, made sure that, that everyone received supplies as, as quickly as they could. And supplies did come quickly from, from New Westminster. There were three wagon train, or rather, three wagons full of supplies came from New Westminster that same night. And you have the classic photo of the uh, city hall staff in front of the tent, which apparently was, yeah. staged, uh, that was staged a little bit later, but it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a great photograph. <coughs> and, and these people who were operating Hastings Mill. So essentially they become the leaders in this community, don't yeah. they? Yeah, they did, yeah. They, um, they were, some of them were interested in politics, like um, Richard Alexander. He ran against Malcolm McLean to be the first mayor of the city. And it was, uh, I think, a close result. I can't remember how far apart they were spread, but um, mm -hmm. I'm sure Richard Alexander thought that he'd be a shoe in because uh, he was known, he lived in Vancouver for some years, he'd come in um, 1872, I believe, so he had a lot of friends, and, and um, he probably just expected to, to win this mayoralty race, but um, Malcolm McLean, <laughs> he... He got to, more people out to he the He got uh, more people out to vote. Yeah, box. that's a whole other story. <laughs> How he got them there, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there are walk-ons in this story from, from some famous people in, in our history in British Columbia, including uh, a future premier, John Robson. He was just down the road yeah. in New Westminster, a newspaper editor, and how does he connect with, yeah, with Hastings he, Mill's um, story? Well, he was one that was quite instrumental in the dismissal of Captain Stamp. He had it out for Stamp for some reason. He was one of these voracious newspaper writers that wanted a juicy story, and there had been a bit of a tiff between Stamp and Jeremiah Rogers, who ran a logging outfit um, out here at what we now call Jericho Beach. And um, things came to a head, and John Robson took the side of Jeremiah Rogers. So this didn't weigh well with Stamp, but it ultimately also led to his dismissal. His de demise, right? He, yeah. Because the, the mill did go broke at that Yeah, that point, the mill it? was flat broke. Stamp just spent money like it was um, freely available to him and, and things just got way out of hand and out of control. And yeah, he, he overspent vision, and ended up in dire financial straits. And that was 
probably the main reason he was dismissed. But including a massive boat that he built, didn't he? To, yeah, to, to yeah, work the Isabel the <laughs> out of Burrard Inlet Lumber. He wanted to showcase Burrard Inlet Lumber, so he he had this boat commissioned to be built and. Something that is so striking that you have right on the on the front cover of, <laughs> of the book, I don't know if people would believe that these are people standing on top of timber. Yeah. Just the sheer size yeah. of the lumber that was produced here. Tell, tell us a bit about the mill in its heyday, its success. Where was it shipping to and why was this such uh, an important product mm -hmm. around the world? Well, it was high quality timber. It was Douglas fir and cedar, both recognized as, as substantially superior trees for building. And um, it was old growth. It was very, very big, as you can see. I mean, today that probably wouldn't be acceptable to thousand year old to, trees to we're looking people, at probably. To, right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So there, there might be a bit of turmoil about that today. But in the old days, they were known as the British Columbia toothpicks. Because um, <laughs> people, you know, were obviously Im would potential buyers would have been impressed with with the immense size and that nickname kind of emphasized that fact. And where were they shipping to? They were shipping all over the world. Um, a lot of wood went to Australia. Some went to China. Uh, there were logs that were shipped to China for building the Imperial Palace or, or restoring the Imperial Palace in China, um, in Beijing. Places in Europe, England, France, Spain, um, certainly in South America, Valparaiso, Chile. So to supply all of that timber, obviously uh, the mill was cutting beyond its footprint here. It had oh, vast... Absolutely acres or, or rights to to timber up the coast yeah and, and something else i found fascinating in, in in your story is that it's through hastings mill that we see some of the earliest health care in in the province that they they were instrumental in building a hospital up on up yeah on that was Island. at um, rock bay which is about 30 kilometers north of campbell river you drive up the island highway and then you travel in on a, a washboard road for about another 30 kilometers and you're at Rock Bay. And um, not much there today in terms of, you know, what you would have expected in the, a logging camp back in the day, but in, around the turn of the century, it was a, a major logging community on the mm -hmm. north coast of Vancouver Island. And um, I can't quite remember how many people lived there, about 2,000, 3,000, and they, they did. They had a hospital, they had a store, they had um, a school. So this was all built on the, the profits of lumber. And they did have um, a hospital ship that went up there. That was the Columbia, mm -hmm. and the, the um, minister on board, sorry, That's the okay. Reverend John Antle, he was um, in charge of the ship and uh, ministering to the people of Rock Bay and other communities in that area, both physically and spiritually. Mm -hmm. He acted as, as um, oh, he, had, he wore multiple hats. And, and so that was really an important part of the medical care up one, there. one feeds into the other, doesn't yeah. it? That he saw yeah. the need and he was, he was part of efforts to to have a more permanent kind of health care yeah. too wasn't yeah it? yeah and that was financed by hastings mill so mm -hmm. it was probably um, richard alexander that made the decision what was the class structure like at hastings mill like there was who, definitely who was allowed to live there and where were they allowed to live or not yeah there was definitely a class structure at hastings mill there were the haves and the have-nots there were people that were told to live on the outskirts, the the um, Chinese employees in particular were kind of set aside. Um, then there was kind of a middle class community that was a little bit closer to the the sawmill site, and and then there was a small enclave of the wealthy that would have included the the mill manager, Captain um, James Raymer, who took over from Captain Stamp. Um, Captain Soule, who was the, the Hastings Mill stevedore, 
at the time. He was one of the ones that actually lost his home in the, the Great Fire. Um, Indigenous was, people, were, were they allowed to live in Hastings Mill? They would have possibly resided at Kumgumlai. Kum, I'm not sure exactly when they were ousted from Gumgumlai. Uh, a lot of them would have lived on the North Shore in their native community of Uslan. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but that was um, just westward of Moodyville Sawmill. And of course there was Kanaka Ranch, that, that was the, the Hawaiian community, and the Hawaiians intermarried with the indigenous people and they also settled in the area we know today as Stanley Park. So there, there was definitely an indigenous involvement in, in the sawmill. But often missing from our history, our colonial history. And, and yeah. you do take time to talk about what life means arrival, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to do that because um, Hastings Mill, the, the museum as it stands now, is very, very representative of colonialism back in the day and it's also representative of the mistakes that were made back in that day. You know, the Captain Stamp came in and set up this mill. They didn't ask permission from any of the local indigenous community. So, you know, there, there were definitely a lot of things that today would be deemed unthinkable that happened back then. So it, for me, it was a kind of a, a way of apologizing and acknowledging that yes, you know, mistakes were made and, and lives were disrupted. So. There was a beginning and an end of Hastings uh, Mill and the store in, in 1930, I believe, is, is yeah. when it was going to be torn down, but uh, the organization that, that you belong to, the Native Daughters, they saved this building. What did yeah. it take to save this and, and move it where it is now? We don't know exactly who came up with the decision to save the store. I imagine it was um, sort of a group decision by the Native Daughters of that time period. They got the word that the store was going to be demolished. Um, the, the past chief factor at the time, that, that's one of the, the leadership names of the Native Daughters, um, was a lady named Jessie Hall. And she was the daughter of Samuel Greer. And Samuel Greer had um, lost his property to the development uh, to very close to Kitsilano Beach, an area that was once called Greer's Beach. And their entire property was burned down in the name of development. So I suspect that Jesse probably remembered this time and saw history repeating itself with the impending destruction of Hastings Mill. And um, in the day, that's what they did. They would just burn structures where they stood rather than, you know, bringing in a wrecking ball. It was just <laughs> much more timely just to burn them. So she thought, well, you know, that cannot happen to Vancouver's oldest building. So I, I believe it was Jessie that probably rallied everyone to the cause and she got the, uh, the local Pioneer Association involved and it became a group effort to save the store but it was largely spearheaded by the Native Daughters. I should explain that, that to be a Native Daughter back in the day, you had to be born in British Columbia, you had to be over the age of 19, and you, you had to have an active interest in history as well. So that Native purely meant that you were, you were um, Native-born British Columbian. A daughter of the Empire, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yes. basically. Yeah, yeah. 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 Although this, the, with this group, the Empire was British Columbia. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so gotcha. they were very strict on that back in the day. We've lightened up on that a little bit okay. since. Okay. Yeah. And you've created a wonderful and, and sustain a beautiful museum. Uh, there are uh, significant renovations happening to the exterior right now. And I understand that the net proceeds from your publication are going to help uh, achieve that. Yes. And you volunteer here, um, have for, for, for many years. What are some of the favorite parts of your exhibit that you like to, to go back to? It's hard to pin it down to um, a choice few. There, there's so many things about the building that I love, but um, if I could narrow it down to, to my, my top three, my top four, I would say number one for me personally would be Joe Forty's Certificate of Appreciation from the City of Vancouver 
which he received back in 1910 for his lifeguarding services at English Bay Beach. So uh, most people know, I believe today, that Joe Fortage was a, a very well-known and popular lifeguard back in the day at English Bay Beach. There's a memorial fountain to him there in Alexandra Park. He would, he would have taught the workers' children who yeah. worked in this sawmill to... to for sure, for sure. He, he taught three generations of mm -hmm. Vancouver children and their parents how to swim. So he loved the water. He was an, a native of Trinidad, we believe originally, and uh, came out here in 1885 on the Robert Kerr, which you know was so instrumental in, in um, being a shelter for people after the Great Fire. And uh, he just had so much historical connection with Vancouver. Yes. And to have that certificate given to him by the city, that, that's just a treasure for us. And it's in remarkable condition for its age. Another favorite connected to the Great Fire? Yes, we do have some Great Fire artifacts. We have um, Julia Woofer's chair. Julia was uh, a newly married young woman who was um, escaping from the fire with her husband. And, uh, you know, during the fire, people just happened to grab random things, hats and, and bird cages, you know, whatever they could immediately lay their hands on. So her husband grabbed a chair, a wooden chair, and they, the couple ran, or her husband carrying this chair away from the fire. And uh, she kept this chair as a, a treasured family heirloom for many, many years. And then eventually uh, she was into her 90s and she decided to donate the chair to the collection of the Old Hastings Millstorm Museum. So we have that chair still on display and it's in remarkable shape again, like the certificate for its age. And some silverware, I believe. We have some melted cutlery from the Great Fire. They're actually the remains of um, Jessie Ross kitchen cutlery and her um, wedding bouquet holder. There's very little left of them, <laughs> but you can see that the, yeah. the metal was melted by the heat of the flames. And uh, Jessie was the wife of um, Arthur Wellington Ross, who was an early businessman in Vancouver. He was into real estate and she lost her home. And she actually escaped from the fire th with the help of Joe Forties. They were staying at the Sunnyside Hotel along with Joe and um, Joe helped them to escape. Yeah. And, and uh, Squamish people came across with canoes yeah. and, and helped. Yeah, as that's well, a wonderful, wonderful story, really. The Squamish people, they, they had a full frontal view of all this uh, catastrophe happening across the inlet. So they, they were really the first responders. They came across in their canoes and they, they rescued a lot of people. Because a lot of people back in the day, they, they wouldn't have known how to swim. They jumped in the inlet, the, the waves were churning, there was a high wind, there was a lack of visibility with all the smoke around. So the, the Squamish people were, were so instrumental in, in helping the, the fire refugees. And the interesting thing is that as they paddled towards the fire, they sang a paddle song. And uh, we had a, a little reenactment about that here a few years ago when we gave them um, representatives from Uslan, a certificate of appreciation for the, the work that they did that day. I think there's one more uh, particular item you wanted to mention too, and that connects with August Jack Cazzolano. Yes, August Jack Cazzolano's the crossball. So um, back uh, many years ago, August Jack was, was uh, doing some work in an area just not too far from here actually, the foot of McDonald and he found an old abandoned steam tractor in the bush and it had big thick rubber tires. This tractor was originally part of an experiment to have steam tractors run from, um, from Yale to Lytton in the Fraser Canyon and that experiment <laughs> failed miserably. <laughs> so uh, one of the steam tractors actually ended up at Hastings Mill and was used for a while in the logging operations here on the, the west side and then it was just left in, in the bush near the beach there off McDonald. So Chief Catsolano, August Jack, as, as he might have just been known then, he, he found this piece of this rubber tire. So he sliced off a piece with his knife and carved it into a rubber lacrosse ball. And uh, we don't know how it ended up here at Hastings Mill at the, the museum. We know that he was good friends with Jesse Halls 
because they, they had both lost their childhood homes. Catslano had lost his home in Stanley Park to development, so they would have had a lot of empathy for each other. And I suspect that he probably just wanted to donate this special item to the museum. So we've got that on display. And um, unfortunately, my publisher also passed away when the book was in the final production stages. Um, that was Ron Hatch of Ronsdale Press. So he'd been ill for some time and we knew this was happening. So things slowed down a bit there as well. So it might have been a three-year project had it not been for Ron passing away. But I, I think he would have been really pleased to the, the final result. I'd like to thank that. Well, congratulations and thank you for, for your time now. Thank you. It's a pleasure.